<coughs> Ring that bell, make me rich, right? Okay, so let's see, where did we leave off last class? We were talking about section 7.7, .7, which deals with E2 reactions. <clears throat> and we were talking about the regio selectivity of E2 reactions. If you think about this word, regio selectivity, all it means is that the E2 reaction is selective for a region. And what we saw is what governs that regio selectivity is not only the substrate, but the type of base that we use. We said, okay, well, we can make a Zaitsev product. We can make a Hoffman product. The Zaitsev product is the more substituted or the more stable alkene. The Hoffman product is the less stable alkene. And what our conclusion was, based on this table that I have right here, we said, okay, well, if you have an unhindered base like ethoxide, the Zaitsev or the more substituted alkene is the one that's going to predominate. Right, because the ethoxide is going to pull off one of these beta protons here. Remember that the carbon that the bromine is attached to, the leaving group, is the alpha carbon, and the one next to it is a beta carbon. And so the ethoxide would pull off that proton. You'd remove or lose the leaving group, rather, to form the Zaitsev product preferentially. However, you could also pull off a different beta proton, couldn't you? Because there's also beta protons here, right? This is also a beta proton. And so our ethoxide could also pull this off. However, that would produce the Hoffman product and the Hoffman product is less substituted. Therefore, it is less stable. Now, where we see a change or a flip, if you will, in the regio selectivity for the Hoffman versus the Zaitsev is when we choose a bulkier base, a hindered base like um, T-butoxide this here and we use the abbreviation tbuo like that and it's usually potassium that is the cation potassium t-butoxide is a hindered base and you can see that it forms the hoffman preferentially and thus it's going to abstract this beta proton and form the hoffman product we do get some zaitsev but again when we use a hindered base we mostly get the hoffman product and you can see that even exacerbated when you use an even bulkier base you use this giant bulky base here with all these alkyl groups. You have three ethyl groups dangling off here. And so this thing is so bulky that you get not, you know, almost exclusively the Hoffman product. I mean, that's 92%. That's, that's a huge, that's a very good, you know, yield compared to just a measly 8% of the Zaitsev product. And so that is what regio selectivity is in a nutshell. The base is selective for a specific region. It is either selective for this beta proton or this beta proton. If we use an unhindered base like ethoxide or it could be methoxide, okay, or hydroxide, that is going to form the more substituted alkene, the Zaitsev alkene. And if we have a bulky base like potassium t-butoxide or triethylamine or, um, you know, disopropylamine or something like that, we're going to end up preferentially forming the Hoffman product. So that is what regio selectivity is, selective for a region. And here are the other um, uh, hysterically hindered bases that we need to know as chemistry 3101 students and instructors alike. I said potassium T-butoxide is the one my students like the most, and it's the one that's most commonly used in the textbook and solutions manual. However, these amines here, and we study amines in detail in organic chemistry too. These amines, so this is disopropylamine and triethylamine, these are also sterically hindered bases or non-nucleophilic bases, they can be called. And there we go. And you can get some practice from the textbook using the Skill Builder 7.3 or trying the practice problems with the, which uh, have plenty of practice in regio selectivity. And we covered this question last class. And so we're going to skip over that and we're going to start on something new. And so for today's lecture, now we're into brand new territory. So we talked about uh, regio selectivity. So which regio isomer are we going to form? Are we going to form the Hoffman or the Zaitsev? These are, you know, uh, constitutional isomers of each other. But now we're going to talk about stereochemistry, right? Going back to kind of chapter five, stereo selectivity. Um, and the first thing we're going to talk about is how. Uh, a base can produce uh, two stereoisomers. We talked about how cis and trans isomers are stereoisomers because they have the same connectivity of atoms. However, 
They are not identical. Uh, they're not superimposable. And so stereoisomers, let's take a look here. If you have this compound here, this is just three bromo pentane. So three bromo pentane, and we treat it with sodium ethoxide. Well, there's no differentiation between any of the beta protons here, right? We have one, two, three, four. Okay, it wouldn't matter um, which of these protons we're really talking about since they're all, you know, chemically equivalent. We have uh, a plane of symmetry in the molecule. However, what we see is that if you pull off one of those protons, so let me just erase, I'll just erase these two for now. But if you pull off one of these protons, what we see is that depending on whether you pull off, where's my highlighter, this proton or this proton, you can actually get two different products. You can end up with the trans product here, which is the major product, or you can end up with this product, which is the cis product as the minor product. So again, depending on which proton you pull off, the green or the yellow, you can end up with two stereo or two different stereoisomers, the trans and the cis. And if we look at the reaction coordinate diagram of this reaction, what you see is that the activation energy to form the cis is lower, sorry, the activation energy to form the trans is lower than that to form the cis. And we also see that the trans is more stable. So not only is it kinetically favored, it's also thermodynamically favored. We have these two protons that are trans to each other like this, okay. And so again, I'm kind of repeating myself, but that is why we see that the trans is formed preferentially to the cis. Not only is its activation energy lower, but the trans is more uh, thermodynamically stable. Why? Because it's less sterically hindered. Now that is in the case where you have two beta protons. Now pay attention very carefully here. Remember, the carbon that the leaving group is attached to, that's called the alpha carbon. So this is the beta carbon. And on this beta carbon, I have one, two protons. When you have two protons at your beta carbon, the reaction is going to be stereoselective, right? What does selective mean? It means it's selective for one over the other. You're still going to end up with a mixture of trans and cis. However, it is selective for the trans over the cis. Everybody with me on that? Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. If you don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Either unmute your mic or type it into the chat. You will not offend me in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so now what we're going to look at is a scenario where we have an alpha carbon with a leaving group on it, but instead of having two protons on the beta carbon, what happens if we have only one proton on there? The reaction goes from being stereoselective to stereospecific. So what does stereospecific mean? It means instead of getting a mixture of trans and cis, we're only going to get one product. Okay, we're either going to get the E product or the Z product, and you cannot predict which one you're going to get until you examine the molecule and you uh, put it in a confirmation where the leaving group and the proton that are being extracted are put in a specific confirmation, and that's what we're going to cover right now. So check out this molecule. It looks kind of heavy here. You get all kinds of stuff. But the bottom line, what I want you to focus on is this. You've got the alpha carbon. Let's get the leaving group attached to it, the bromine. Okay, so we've got two beta carbons. We've got this beta carbon and this one. The beta carbon on the right-hand side, we see that it's attached to three methyl groups. There's a methyl group here, here, and here. So it has no hydrogens attached to it, right? need to be able to, re to read bond line structures. There are no H's attached here. Zilch, nothing. Okay, so that means it's not going to be regioselective because the only region it can pull a proton off of is this beta carbon. Now, in terms of uh, stereochemistry, the reaction is not going to be stereoselective because there aren't two beta protons. There's only one measly beta proton. And that means it's going to be stereospecific. It can only pull off this proton. It's the only possibility, right? The only possibility is for your base. Let's imagine it's sodium ethoxide. The only possibility you've got is for the ethoxide to pull off this proton, form the double bond, and you lose your leaving group. But you've got four different substituents, don't you? You've got a phenyl. You've got a methyl. You've got a tert-butyl group. 
and you've got a proton that are still going to be attached to the double bond. And what do you get? Do you get the E product or the Z product? You can see them down here. We have the E and the Z isomer shown down here. And it tells you that if you have this compound, you actually only get one product. We only get this product here. So this would be the E product in this case. And I'll let you determine that that's correct. But this is the E isomer here. And this one would be the Z isomer. If you need to go back and review that, feel free to do that. Review your E and Z. But again, we only get the E isomer. It's specific. We just get one thing. We get no mixture, none. We get none of this at all, zero. Well, why is that? And that's what we're going to uncover now. And if you were with me before I started the lecture today, I went over this with you a little bit. And I said that the starting material has to be in a very specific conformation where the bromine and the proton, so our leaving group and our beta proton, are what are called anti periplanar to one another. So check this out. It says to rationalize the stereospecificity of this reaction, we have to look at the transition state. In the transition state, the carbon hydrogen bond highlighted in red and the carbon bromine bond highlighted in red that are breaking have to be rotated into the same plane, right? You see how there's no dash or wedge on here. It's just a line, just a line here. That tells you that all of this is in the same plane, right? It's all perfectly flat. They're all lying in the same plane. And the word that we use to describe that is we would say the bromine, the leaving group, and the hydrogen, the beta hydrogen, are coplanar. They're all in the same plane. They're all lying flat, right? Of course, you have the dashes and wedges. This is going out towards you. This is going into the page. Okay, that's fine. But again, everything that's highlighted there um, is all in the same plane. Okay, so that's the first requirement. And the second requirement is this. There's two possibilities. Where, uh, there's two rotamers where we can have the hydrogen that's highlighted in red and the bromine or leaving group in the same plane. We can have one rotamer where the hydrogen and the bromine are in the same plane, okay, but they're eclipsing each other, okay? And you know that an eclipsed conformation is going to be higher energy than this one here where the bromine and the hydrogen are still in the same plane, but they're anti to each other, right? The bromine is up here and the hydrogen is down here. This is a staggered conformation. A staggered conformation is certainly more stable than an eclipsed conformation. So again, to review, they're both coplanar, right? In this one, the bromine and the hydrogen are coplanar. Here, they're coplanar. What's the difference is that the one on the right, that rotamer, uh, is, is eclipsed, and so it's higher in energy. And therefore, the transition state that allows the elimination to occur, this stereospecific reaction, is going to be the one that I have in the yellow circle, or this is the confirmation, I should say, that the molecule has to be in. It has to be in this confirmation. And so when we form the double bond, what we're going to see is this. You're going to form the double bond between this carbon and this carbon, and what you're going to end up seeing is that these two groups are going to be on the same side of the double bond, and these two groups are going to be on the same side of the double bond. Okay, and we're going to get some practice in drawing that today. So just take a look at this here. If we look at that transition state, not transition state, I keep calling it that. I should call it the this um, rotomer or this conformer. Okay, anyhow, so this rotomer, this one here where the bromine and the hydrogen are coplanar, when the base comes in, and I can't draw the entire mechanism because you can't draw the double bond being formed, but when your ethoxide comes in and rips off this proton and you lose the leaving group, again, what you see is that the phenyl and the hydrogen are going to end up on the same side of the double bond, right? And then the methyl and the terbutyl are going to be on the same side of the double bond. And if we just highlight this carbon in yellow, okay, that's the carbon in front. So you can see that the methyl and the phenyl are both attached to that yellow carbon, and then the one in the back has the tert-butyl and the hydrogen on it. And then if we examine this molecule very carefully, this alkene, what we see is that you have the highest priority group on this carbon and on this carbon, and therefore it is the E product. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. This is not simple, but um, it's very important okay, that you understand the requirement for um, uh, for the for the leaving group and the beta hydrogen to be coplanar. Well, I know that there's a lot of text on this slide, and students don't like slides that are just text. But let me just try to guide you through this. It's more just kind of 
definitions here and I'll go over it with you very quickly. Okay. So you know this whole thing about the leaving group and the um, and the beta hydrogen being in, um, in the same plane. So let's say you have your bromine here, you have a hydrogen down here, and then we've got the other groups. We'll just ignore what they are for now. But we have everything like this. And it looks like the way that it's drawn in the Newman projection, it looks like this bond angle or this dihedral angle, I should say, is exactly 180 degrees. But what we actually find is that that angle doesn't have to be a strict 180 degrees. It can vary from there. It can be anywhere between 175 and 179, and it still, still works. You still get the E2 elimination. And so if we were to call it coplanar, then it's not really true because coplanar would mean they're exactly 180 degrees apart. And so we use the word periplanar. Thus, moving forward, I'm never going to say coplanar. I'm always going to say periplanar, and we're always going to be talking about the beta hydrogen and the leaving group being anti-periplanar uh, to each other. And so in order for the elimination to occur, the hydrogen that's being abstracted and the leaving group have to be anti-periplanar. It's a very important term to each other. And it says here that even though the E isomer is usually more stable because it's less sterically hindered, you don't necessarily always get the E isomer. You might get the Z isomer in cases. And so you can't just take a guess, like, oh, I'll just guess that it's probably the E. No, you have to draw the Newman projection and examine all four groups. You know, these two groups are going to be on the same side. These two groups are going to be on the same side. Okay, you have to examine it very carefully before you draw the alkene. And then you can analyze it. Is this the E product or is this the Z product? So let's try this question here, and this is just kind of training our eye to draw the alkene and put the R groups in the correct positions. That's all we're doing here. So if we look at the first example, we have R1 and R2 over here. We have R1 and R2 over here, and we can clearly see, hopefully, that our hydrogen, this bond, the carbon-carbon bond here, and the bromine, everything is anti-periplanar, right? If you were to take your eyeball and look down this bond. Let me draw a human eyeball the best I can. Here's the eyelashes on top. So if you look down this carbon-carbon bond, what would you see? Let me draw it. Oops, need my pen. There we go. So what you would see would look something like this. You'd have the hydrogen going down. You would have R2. I'll draw it in blue. So you'd have R2 over here. You'd have R1 over here. On the right hand side, you have the bromine going up, anti periplanar, to the hydrogen. Then you have this R2 in the back over, oops, R2. And then you have this R1 over here. And so when you remove, you're going to remove the bromine and the hydrogen, and you're going to make an alkene. I'm going to put this carbon at the top because I think that's the way it was done in the previous example. So now we're going to have. After the elimination, right, your base is going to come along. I'll put a lone pair. Ah, yeah. I'll put a lone pair on my base. The base is going to abstract the proton. We form the double bond. We lose the leaving group. What's our alkene going to look like? I'm going to draw it like this. Okay, this will be the carbon that I have highlighted in yellow. What's attached to it? I have an R2 in blue on the left hand side, I've got an R1 on the right hand side. The carbon in the back also has the R2 over here. And then we have the R1 down here like this. Are you with me on that? No pun intended, R, all these R1s and R2s. Is everybody with me on that one? So you would call this um, a Z alkene because it's definitely a Z alkene, anyhow. Okay, cool. So if, we're, if you're with me on that, let's try the other one. I'll go a little bit faster this time. Again, if you were to look down this bond right here with your eyeball, so let me practice my eyeball drawing. There we go. You're looking down this carbon-carbon bond. What do you see? Okay, let's see. We've got the hydrogen going straight down. We've got um, uh, the R2 going up and to the left. That means we've got the R1 going up and to the right like that. Then we have this okay so what's in the back we've got the bromine going straight up that's good because it's anti-periplanar to the hydrogen but now we have this r2 on this side and then we have this r1 over here 
we're going to eliminate the bromine and the hydrogen. I'll highlight this carbon. And what happens after the elimination reaction, again, where the base is going to come in, it's going to abstract this proton. We form the double bond. We lose the leaving group. And we end up with an alkene. We've got R2 going up and to the left, same as before. We've got R1 going up and to the right. But now we have this R1 going down and to the right, and we have the R2, or sorry, R1 going down and to the left, and the R2 going down and to the right. Do you follow me on that one? On my elimination? If you understand this, you're going to be sound as a pound when it comes to actually trying it with a real molecule that doesn't just have R groups, but has been, you know, phenols and terbutals and all that kind of stuff. And we will get some practice on that. So let's just review the definition. Oh, I thought I had it in here somewhere. Here it is. Uh, th this is just, you know, more rehashing what I just told you. Uh, let's see here. So again, I'm just rehashing, you know, I think it bears repeating. Okay, so I'll go over this slide with you. Look, if you have a beta carbon and it's got two hydrogens, you can rip off this one or you can rip off this one. Depending on which one you rip off, it still has to be antiperiplanar to the leaving group. And that is why you end up with a mixture of cis and trans or E and Z, depending on the situation. Okay, that's stereo selectivity. It says down here that E2 can only be stereo specific when both the alpha and the beta carbon are stereoisomers. That's a requirement for stereo specificity. Put another way, you see this diagram right here. If you have a compound with two beta hydrogens, you can get a major and a minor product. Whereas if you have two chiral centers, you've got a stereoisomer to begin with, you're only going to end up with one product. Depending on your stereoisomer, you're going to end up with a specific stereoisomer in the end. And that's the difference between stereospecificity and stereoselectivity. Let's take a look at some problems. 7.15, identify the major and minor products of the E2 reaction that occurs when each of the following substrates is treated with a strong base. So let's take this first one and we're gonna treat it with a strong base. I'll just write the word base. Okay, it just says strong base. Let's not overcomplicate it. So let's examine the starting material, our substrate. The alpha carbon is the carbon that has the bromine attached to it. That means that this is a beta carbon and this is a beta carbon. Does the blue beta carbon have any hydrogens attached to it? Yes or no? And it's not a trick question. I would never try to fool you. Could anybody answer that? Does the blue carbon have any hydrogens attached to it? Exactly, Angel. No, it's got none. So we don't have to worry about the blue carbon at all. Don't worry about it. It's not going to cause an elimination anyhow. But the green carbon will, won't it? Right? The, this carbon, where I have this, We've got two beta hydrogens. We've got one coming out and we've got one going into the page like this. And so what that means is that the base can abstract this proton and cause an elimination or the base could abstract this proton and cause an elimination. And so the reaction is going to be stereo selective. Okay, the reaction will be stereo, stereo, the reaction is going to be stereoselective for the trans over the cis. You don't need to draw a Newman projection. No, not required because you know you're going to end up with a mixture of cis and trans. Let's draw them out. The first one, we'll draw the double bond like this. Oops. We're going to have what? On one side, we've got a tert-butyl group. So let's pencil that in. And on the other side, we're going to have the phenyl. Okay, so this is going to be one of our stereoisomers. This is trans. So this is the trans product. Plus, we're also going to end up with the cis. Again, you don't even have to draw a Newman projection because you know you're going to get both. So let's draw the cis. It's not the neatest drawing in the world, is it? Do a little better, maybe. There we go. So here's the cis. And since the cis is so sterically hindered, it's going to be the minor product. And the trans will be the major product. So a stereo selective reaction. Okay, are you with me on that one? Any questions about that one? Okay, 
If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask me now if we look at the next one. The substrate's very similar, but it's not the same, is it? Now we have our alpha carbon. We know there's no beta protons here. In fact, there's only one beta proton in the entire molecule. It's this proton that I wrote here in red, right? This is our beta carbon. It's the only thing. And the confirmation that it's shown here, you have the hydrogen going into the page and the bromine going into the page, and therefore, um, they are not anti-periplanar uh, to each other. They're not coplanar at all. So what we need to do first is draw a Newman projection, and then we're going to adjust that Newman projection so that the hydrogen in red and the bromine are anti-periplanar to each other, which is going to lead us to be able to draw the correct stereoisomer that's formed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a Newman projection looking down this bond, and I'm going to put my eyeball here. Okay, so here's my eyeball. There's my eyelash. This is what we're going to see. So let's draw it. Oops, what we're going to see is, so we'll start with this. This is the carbon in back. This is the carbon in front. So going straight up, I'm going to see my phenyl group, right? All of this. Going down into the left, I'm going to see the hydrogen that I need to use in the elimination. And then I've got my methyl group over here. You can put CH3 on the end if you want. You can just leave it. As long as we know there's a, there's a methyl group, you could write ME for methyl. That works too. All right, now in the back, let's see what we have. We have the bromine going up into the left like this. We've got our hydrogen, which isn't shown here, but there's a hydrogen over here. Okay, and then we have our tert butyl going down to the bottom. You could draw it like this, the bond line structure. You can also write BU or, T, or TBU like that, and that means tert butyl. That's totally fine. So now what we're going to do is we're going to rotate this bond. We're going to twist this so that the bromine and this hydrogen become anti-periplanar to each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the hydrogen. So let me just remove the highlighter from here. I'm going to move the hydrogen over to this position, which is going to cause the methyl group to go into this position and cause the phenyl group to come down to this position. Okay, let me erase some of that. There's a lot of stuff there. So let's draw what happens when you rotate that bond um, counterclockwise by 120 degrees. And what we end up with is this. So we're going to put in the back, we've still got our bromine here, our hydrogen here, our tert butyl group uh, down here. Let me just move that a little bit. So it's going to look like that. And then in the front now, we are going to have the hydrogen antiperiplanar to the bromine. We're going to have the methyl group up here, and we're going to have the phenyl down here like this. And now you can see that the bromine and the hydrogen are coplanar, or sorry, antiperiplanar. And so we fulfilled the requirement for, um, for the molecule to do the elimination. Now the base can come in. So now our base can come in and it can abstract the proton and do the elimination. So what's our alkene gonna look like? Let's try the same strategy. I'm gonna highlight this carbon in the front, okay? And I'm actually going to put my double bond on kind of an angle like this, because that's the way it would be formed like this. I've got the methyl group in the front here. I've got the phenyl over here. And in the back, I've got the hydrogen on the same side as the methyl. And I've got the tert butyl group over here. And that is going to be the final product. And so we see that we actually end up with the Z product in this case. And there we go. And that is how you solve a problem that is a stereospecific elimination. The hardest part for a lot of students is drawing the Newman projection and then drawing it in a way that you have the leaving group and the proton anti-periplanar to each other. And then once you've got that, you can go and you can draw the alkene correctly. Does everybody follow me on at least the rationale of that? Even if you're not thinking, oh, I could go teach that to anybody off the street. As long as you're just with me on the rationale, because you will have to practice it. I've taught the class enough to know that for somebody to just see this in, you know, five minutes and say, oh, yeah, I'll have mastered this forever. That would be pretty difficult. All right, cool. Any questions about that? Stereospecificity, very important concept in organic chemistry.
because now we're going to take it and we're going to turn it up. Not, a, I, I, not, not turn it up a notch. We're just going to look at it in, in a different way. We're now going to talk about the stereospecificity of E2 reactions on cyclohexanes. Okay. If you remember cyclohexanes, that if you have um, a group that's going up and axial, like this chlorine, it means that the groups that are next to it that are going to be going up are up and equatorial, then up and axial, then up and equatorial, then up and axial. Remember that how that alternates up and axial, up and equatorial. And the same thing with down, right? If you have something that's going, um, you know, where's my eraser? Here we go. If I have something that's going down and axial, the next group is going to be going down and equatorial, then down and axial, then down and equatorial. If you remember that, I think you'll find this pretty reasonable. So let's take a look here. What if we want to do a dehydrohalogenation? That word actually came up in a previous slide and I didn't address it. All it means is loss of, just means loss of a hydrogen and X, where X could be, you know, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And you can see that in the last problem, we were losing HBr. Here we'd want to lose HCl. Okay, so that's dehydrohalogenation. Well, let's say you want to do it in a cyclohexane where you have your leaving group attached to the ring. Well, the same requirement that we needed for that stereospecific reaction that we just covered is found when we have a leaving group on a cyclohexane. Check it out. If you look at the Newman projection, when you have the chlorine or your leaving group, any leaving group in the axial position, in that case, you can have a proton that's antiperiplanar to each other or to it. However, you cannot do an elimination. Pay, 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 pay close attention. It's very cool. You cannot do an elimination reaction if your leaving group is in, is in an equatorial position because in that case, what's anti-periplanar uh, to each other? It's just a methylene. It's not a hydrogen. So it won't work. And summarized, you know, what I just said is that given the anti-periplanar requirement, E2 elimination can only occur when the leaving group is in the axial position. It's the only option, and I'll add to that, the hydrogen also has to be in the axial position. You see that this is up in axial? Well, there's your hydrogen down in axial. Everything that's involved in the E2 elimination has to be axial. Not only that, but the leaving group and the hydrogen have to be anti to each other. Otherwise, you get no elimination. So check it out. It says here, it's a great question. Which of these two molecules will not be able to undergo an E2 elimination? And why is that? Now, you might have to draw a chair to, uh, <coughs> to understand why that is, but I don't think you do. Check it out. Look, if this chlorine is up and axial, okay, that means that this proton here, this red proton, is down and axial. Okay, so that means you can do an elimination of this hydrogen and this chlorine. Furthermore, you could do it with this one too, because this is also pointing down and axial. Now, I don't think that you need to draw the chair here whatsoever. Let me get my black pen out. You could, if you really felt like you needed to, uh, let me just draw papers. I hate drawing on the corner of the iPad. There we go. Look something like this. So that means you can have this chlorine going up like this, but you've got a hydrogen that's down here and down here. So the requirement is met in both of these, uh, for both of these hydrogens. They're both anti-periplanar or anti-coplanar to the chlorine. Are you with me on that? Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that, because then we're gonna take a look at this guy and we're gonna discuss why this can't do an E2 elimination. I'm sure you figured it out already, but the reason why is if this chlorine is up and axial, that means that this hydrogen is up in equatorial, and therefore it cannot be antiperiplanar. The same thing here. This is up and up and equatorial. So no E2 elimination can occur. All right? If you were to draw a chair, I'll just do it very quickly. What you've got is your leaving group going up like this, but your hydrogen is going up here, and your hydrogen is going up here. So no E2 elimination can occur. You've got those methyl groups going down, but you can't do an elimination with a methyl group. Okay, it won't work. So the answer is yes, E2 elimination, and no, no E2 elimination will occur for this molecule. Again, I don't think it's necessary to draw a chair. You just do the analysis up and axial, down and axial, so on and so forth. 
So let's take a look at this example here. It says rationalize the products that are formed in these reactions. Okay, here we only get one product. Okay, we have this interesting compound here. Why do we only get one product? Let me show you very quickly. You have two beta hydrogens, or actually you have a total of three, but this one, whoops, where's my pen? Let's draw this one in blue. So this one is going down. So if this chlorine is going down and is axial, which it has to be in order to leave, that would mean that this hydrogen is going down and equatorial. So that means no elimination can happen between these two carbons. Whereas if I have this hydrogen here, which is going up, and of course there's two hydrogens, right? There's this one, but this hydrogen that's pointing up, I'm going to erase the other one. The hydrogen that's pointing up is up and axial. Therefore, this is up and axial, this is down and axial, and we can form a double bond here, and that is why we make the double bond right here. This is the only possible product. All right, and it also says here that the E2 reaction is slow, and there's a good reason for that. I'll explain that in a second. But if we look at this one, I'll go over it again a little bit quicker, right? If we have the chlorine as being up and axial, that would mean that this hydrogen is down and axial. So we can form a double bond here. And we see that right here. And it would mean that this hydrogen is also down, down, and uh, down. Come on. There's my eraser. There we go. Down and axial. And so we could also form a double bond here. And that's this product here. So we end up with a mixture in the second case. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that or any questions. Don't hesitate to interrupt me. Is everybody with me on up and axial, down and axial? That's the requirement for an E2 elimination, right? Because then the two groups are uh, anti periplanar. Okay, it says here that one of the alkyl halides undergoes E2 elimination way faster than the other. So this one is uh, really slow, right, to make this product, but you can make it, whereas this one is really fast. I'll show you very quickly why. Well, well, I'm going to circle this, or I'll put yellow highlighter next to it, okay? So see if you can follow along with me here. I'll zoom in a smidge. If we draw the chair, it reveals why it's so sluggish. Because if the chlorine is down in axial, which it has to be in order for the elimination to occur, and of course the red proton is up in axial, well, check this out. The terbutyl is up. So if this is down in axial, that means this is up in axial. So you've got this giant terbutyl group that's up and it's in the axial position. So you have the one, three diaxial interactions between the terbutyl and these two hydrogens. If you look at the diastereomer, I drew that way too big, didn't I? If you look at the diastereomer, this molecule here, so let me draw it like this. I'm gonna have to draw it a little bit smaller, okay? So if we have the chlorine, um, I'll draw it, uh, let me see here. I'll put the chlorine, let me draw it in the same confirmation. I'll draw the chair the same way. Here we go. So if we have our chlorine going um, up and axial here, it means that the terbutyl group is going up. Sorry, I had to draw in the wrong direction. It's going up, but it's equatorial. And so if it's equatorial, you've got the giant group equatorial, so it's not nearly as unstable. All right, it's just, a more stable diastereomer, and that's why the E2 reaction would be faster. Anyhow, kind of a quick explanation, but that covers it. So what did we learn in section 7.7, .7, Clinton? A lot of stuff, huh? A lot of information. So look, there's many factors to consider when you're looking at drawing an E2 mechanism. First thing is, is the reaction going to be stereospecific or stereoselective? If it's stereospecific, it's when you have one, put here, one beta hydrogen. If it's stereoselective, you've got two beta hydrogens. And then when you have regioisomers to consider, are you going to get the Zaitsev as the major or the Hoffman as the major? If you have an unhindered base, you're going to get the Zaitsev preferentially. If you have a hindered base, you get the Hoffman product. And again, you can see it put right here on the slide. And I did not write this phrase. This was written by Dr. Klein himself. The only way to master this material is to do lots of practice problems. It's the only way to do it. A number of semesters ago, 
I had a student whose um, father was actually a, a professor of organic chemistry at another university and the son was in my class and uh you know he told me he said oh my dad's an organic chemist he said oh that's cool you know we talked about it for a second and he said i told my dad i'm taking organic chemistry one and his father said you know you're gonna have to do every practice problem that was the first thing that came out of this guy's mouth so and it's the first thing that comes out of you know it comes from dr klein as well and dr klein the author of our textbook is a very experienced organic chemistry instructor and so he knows what he's talking about with all that in mind, why don't we try a couple of practice problems as a group? And then we're going to move into something new. We'll move into section 7.8. Well, let's finish this section up. If we take a look at this reaction here, it says predict the major and minor products. We've got a base. We've got an alkyl halide. Now, what's going to happen? We have our alpha carbon. We have two beta carbons, don't we? We have this beta carbon. It's got three hydrogens. One, two, three here so i'll just put in one of them i guess like can make it a little prettier we've got this one here and then at the other beta carbon i'll highlight this one in green then you have this beta proton over here like this so we've got two beta protons that i have written on here if the beta proton gets abstracted from this carbon where i have it highlighted in blue that reaction is not going to be uh, stereo specific or stereo selective because if you form a double bond here right, if you form a double bond there then there's going to be no uh, e or z cis or trans because you're going to end up with two hydrogens on the end anyway and so we could draw that product right away so why don't i just pencil it in over here we'll have our aromatic ring okay and then we're going to have our double bond um, Oops, am I drawing this correctly? No, there we go, that's better, Mr. Dion. Okay, I'm gonna have my double bond over here. And then I still have my isopropyl group back in the page like this. But that is the Hoffman product, okay? That's the Hoffman product. Um, and this is an unhindered base. So the Zaitsev product, where we form a double bond here, that is going to be the major product. However, with this, Abstraction of the green proton. My question to you guys is this. If I pull off that green proton, so if my base comes in, okay, my base comes in and it removes this green proton, I form the double bond and I lose my leaving group, would that reaction be stereo specific or stereo selective? Would you categorize that as stereo specific or stereo selective? Could anybody answer that one? <clears throat> yes. I've only got one beta proton, don't I? Right? Yes, I see all my students have the correct answer. The reaction is stereo specific. So let's put a little line here and we'll put for this proton, it is stereo specific. I'll put it like that, stereo specific. Okay, and so what do we have to do? We're gonna have to draw a Newman projection and why don't we do it with the human eye? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Why don't we do it with the human eye looking down, with the human eye looking down this carbon-carbon bond right here. So let's start by drawing that. I'll draw it with my black pen. So what am I gonna see? I'm gonna go a little quicker on the Newman projections now because I'm gonna assume that you know how to draw a Newman projection. I've got my phenyl going straight down. I've got my isopropyl going up and to the left. And I have my hydrogen over here. This is the hydrogen that's going to be involved in the E2 process. Then what else do I have on the back? Back, I've got um, I've got my methyl group going straight up. So this is the methyl group. I've got the chlorine on this side over here, and that's the chlorine that's going to be involved in the elimination. And then I also have another proton coming over here. Okay, so that's my Newman projection. The hydrogen and the chlorine circled are the ones that are gonna be involved in the mechanism. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate it so that I'm gonna put the proton, the hydrogen over in this position. I'm kind of running out of space, so I'm gonna draw it over here. So now I'm gonna have the hydrogen over here. I've rotated this counterclockwise 120 degrees. 
I've got my isopropyl group going straight down, and then I have my phenyl going up and to the right. Nothing has changed on the carbon in the back. So I have my methyl group going straight up, this hydrogen going down and to the left, and then I have my chlorine, the same old place. And you can see that now I have fulfilled the requirement with this Newman projection where the hydrogen and the chlorine are anti-periplanar to each other. And so my base is gonna come along, it's gonna remove the proton in the red circle, I'm gonna lose the chlorine in the red circle, and I'm gonna form a double bond between the two carbons here. So let's draw what the product is going to look like after the E2 reaction. Let's see, I'll highlight the carbon here, the, the one in the front in yellow, and I'm gonna draw my double bond over here because I'm kind of running out of space like this. So I've got my hydrogen going up and to the left, and I have my phenyl over here like this, okay? Then I've got, um, sorry, where the heck am I? Uh, nope, I drew it incorrectly. Sorry, my mistake. Doo -doo -doo. There. Um, let's do it like this. Why don't we put this carbon in the bottom like that? Okay, there we go. It's a little bit simpler. So now we have the phenyl over here. We have the isopropyl group over here. We have the methyl on the same side as the uh, as the phenyl group. And what else? We have the hydrogen over here. And that is your final product. That's it right there. All right, so is that an E or a Z alkene that we've drawn here? Could anybody tell me, would this be an E or a Z alkene? I would say it would be the Z alkene because this is our highest priority group on this carbon and this is the highest priority group here. So this is the Z isomer and this is the major product and this would be the minor product of the reaction. There you have it, my friends. Those are the two products that you get. Are you going to have to practice reactions that are stereospecific elimination? The answer is yes. Absolutely. Let's take a look at the next one. I'll do it a little bit quicker. We've got a bromine that's going up on this cyclohexane. So if this bromine is going up and axial, it would mean that this hydrogen is going down and axial. And it would mean that this hydrogen is going down, down and axial. So we have two beta protons that fulfill the requirement of being antiperiplanar to their leaving group. And thus we can draw two products. So let's draw the first one. If I was to abstract the proton in red, I would end up with this compound. And then if I was to abstract the proton in blue, then I'm going to end up with this compound where I have the double bond here. The methyl remains untouched. Now, which one of these is going to be the major? The major one is going to be the more substituted alkene. So major because this is the Zaitsev. And then this would be the minor product because it is the Hoffman product named after David Hassel Hoffman. Okay, there we go. So that finishes section 7.7, .7, which deals with E2 eliminations. A lot of things to cover in E2 eliminations. Again, we started off, started off with regioselectivity. So regioselectivity, so like, And that was, you know, do you get the Hoffman or the Zaitsev? So Zaitsev versus Hoffman. Then after that, we looked at um, stereo selectivity. So stereo, stereo selectivity. And this is when you have two beta protons. Do you get the E or the Z predominating? And then um, we have major and minor products. And then you have stereo specificity. So stereo. Stereo specific. Uh, I should put E. So here I'll put Z and E. And then here you'd get Z or E, only one or the other. All right, and that covers section 7.7. .7.